Uh, and he says in his book, The Myth of Colorblind Christians, something like that uh, when when folks picked up the paper on Monday morning, the, the Sunday sermon was still ringing in their ear. Right? And when they uh, read their Bibles, they did not put down their political commitments. Um, and so, so I started to have to imagine within that picture, like the guy who's writing this is not just a representative of this faceless government structure, right? He is a Christian and uh, he's the chair of the Redevelopment Commission. He's helped to plan these projects. And as I started going back through all the, the archives and, and all the places I was kind of digging up, like Christian identity within the folks who are uh, planning, executing, and eventually profiting from these projects, it always comes up as like a salient feature um, that, that's put out in official documents and that kind of thing. You know. Hey, welcome back, Faithful Politics listeners and watchers. If you're watching our YouTube channel, we're glad that you found us. Um, I am your political host, Will Wright, and I'm joined by your faithful host, Pastor Josh Bertram. How's it going, Josh? Doing great. Thanks, Will. And our guest today is Greg Gerald, author of Our Trespasses, White Churches, and the Taking of American Neighborhoods. He's based in Charlotte, North Carolina, and is a community leader and storyteller who explores the intersection of history, theology, and social justice. His book offers a compelling critique of urban renewal and its impact on black neighborhoods, focusing on the role of white churches. So welcome to the show, Greg. Hey, Will, Josh, thanks for having me on. I really appreciate it. Yeah. Also, he's, he, he's a he's an accomplished musician. Is it a sa- saxophonist? Is, it, is that the yeah. right? Yeah, that's it. <laughs> that's, so, yeah, I, I agree. Yeah, we, 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 were, we were jamming to some of his um, some of his hits. You can find it actually on Apple Music, which is where I was listening to yeah. it. So, uh, well, um, so, Greg, you know, you you wrote a book about urban renewal um, and its impact on black neighborhoods. So I, I'd love to, number one, find out why you wrote a book um, about, you know, the impact of churches on black neighborhoods. And then probably more importantly is like, what the heck is urban renewal? All right. Yeah. Uh, so personal motivations are, uh, are always important as to, you know, what we're doing and how it comes about. So I, I actually, I went to seminary in Richmond um, at, nice. at Baptist Theological Seminary in Richmond, uh, right across the street from Union Presbyterian. Um, when my wife and I moved here and some other friends uh, from up there, we started a, a little religious community. For a while, they were calling us new monastic communities. We Catholic workers are sort of our kind of our calling card. Um, and so we moved into a, a, a very poor neighborhood, almost all of our neighbors black, uh, an oppressed place. And... Um, I, I'm not sure that we had the capacity yet to understand like how that neighborhood had come to be and what uh, those of us who showed up kind of with middle class backgrounds in you know white coated bodies um, exactly what all that meant. I mean, there's no way to understand it, all of it. But over the past 20 years, we've done a lot of work around hospitality and solidarity, around resisting gentrification, uh, trying to create. A better environment here, and uh, and yet sort of confronted with the the catch twenty two that uh, we bought a a really cheap house in a really undervalued neighborhood, and despite all of our work at resistance, now you know on a very personal level, uh, we stand to profit from all all of these kind of structural changes, right? So that there's that aspect, and then there was simply trying to understand. Um, from theological perspective, how did our city come to be this way? How did how, how do these changes that happen in neighborhoods all over the country, like, you know, what's the what's the cultural underpinnings of all of that? Um, so I started digging around. Urban renewal just kind of lives large in the story of American cities. Uh, really changed the the landscape of our cities all across the country. So. Uh, Urban Renewal, 1949 to 1974, was official policy uh, in a federal division called the Housing and Home Finance Agency. Um, The goal stated in the legislation of the Housing Act of 1949 was slum clearance. And uh, so the way the program worked was it was federally funded, but it was locally managed and identified. Um, And so... 
so people in charge in 1949 and 1955 and 1960 uh, determined what neighborhoods were slums and then asked the federal government for funding to raise those places to the ground. So uh, that meant that you know all of the all the cultural and theological assumptions about what made for the kind of neighborhood that should be preserved and what made for the kind of neighborhood that was expendable. All those were built into to the program. Um, so that means uh, in, in the United States, black neighborhoods were kind of first on the chopping block. Uh, other poor white and uh, other poor people of color, those neighborhoods were also subjected to these kinds of projects, regardless of whether they were actually uh, slums. Right? What, what was a slum was in the eye of of the guy who was trying to take the land. <laughs> um, hmm. And so there were, they were, there were always justifications that could be found over the course of those 25 years, more than 560 square miles of American cities were raised to the ground. That's the Island of Manhattan 25 times over. Um, there were millions and millions of people displaced. The displacement got so bad that in 1966, they stopped keeping official statistics uh, because it was just too ugly and uh, folks didn't really want to know what was going on anymore. So uh, that was the that was the program in short. What we got in the aftermath of it, uh, in particular, were large infrastructure projects, especially urban highways. And it's urban highways that have sustained and made possible both the the social segregation that we still live with in so many of our cities the ecological crisis that the suburbs come to really embody from the extremely inefficient use of land, the dependence on individual oil burning vehicles uh, to get around, right? The, all the associated runoff, the expense of infrastructure, all that kind of thing. So urban renewal in a lot of ways kind of sets the stage for the social crises um, that we come to call the inner city and sort of the the oppressions that follow with that, as well as kind of the insulated silences of the suburbs that kind of have this has this self reinforcing architecture about what the good life is. So that's urban renewal. So that's extremely fascinating because when you think about infrastructure, you know, a lot of pi- people might hear that word and just kind of start to doze off like oh infrastructure okay and oh, then right. like doesn't seem very important and yet it's hugely important certainly in its implications and in keeping things running i would love for you to kind of go into more depth about how it is that this like i i hear you about this program that they raised certain slums to the ground, what they considered slums, right? They displaced people. So I'm sure that that has something to do with the, you know, the, uh, I'm, for whatever reason, the, the word is escaping me, but the, uh, the housing like projects um, or like government subsidized housing essentially had something to do with that, right? When they start to have to put people or place them somewhere and they create these kind of housing projects or whatever it is for people to be placed into. But I would love for you to go into more depth about like how it actually is that like the highways, how does that separate inner city from suburb how is the separation actually accomplished in like w- within this uh the this urban renewal structure and as, i guess you said it ended in like 1970 something is that what you 1974 said 1974 is when the the official policies ended the official yeah. policy ended so what ha- happened after that to perpetuate it yeah so uh, okay, those are those are good questions. So, um, cities were certainly segregated before urban renewal. So it's not like urban renewal invented that segregation. Um, but what it did, it's sort of in the aftermath of those projects, was to reinforce it in new ways. 
Um, so, you know, one of the, one of those ways, for instance, was simply that highways, um, which were the mo- again the most common project built there, um, create these enormous barriers um, that this so they're physical barriers. If you walk on, on over an overpass, you know, going over a highway or, or, or under an underpass, um, you might walk the distance of one block. But psychologically, it feels much larger than it is, right? and it becomes sort of an empty space. So what makes uh, cities function, what keeps them kind of livable and interesting, are eyes on the street, are other people around. Right? But highways create these big dead zones through what otherwise should be um, kind of bursting with activity. Right? The only activity that's going on is going on at 60 miles an hour, so there's no interpersonal nature to it. Um, so that's one thing. The other thing that it does is that highways have limited access. Uh, and so for instance, in Charlotte, or I think y'all are in Richmond, if you want to get across interstate 95 through downtown, um, you've got like two or three choices. So whereas cities are built to have like multiple ways to get around right now, your, your walk to work has become much longer. You've become more dependent on having a, a vehicle. Um, the The infrastructure that was built into the city in terms of density of, of businesses, of institutions, of opportunities, that gets evacuated. Uh, and so poor people have to become more dependent on cars, which are quite expensive, right? And so you've, you've begun to limit economically the number of options that have been built into what should be dense spaces with lots of options there. Um, and so, so that then reinforces segregation because um, people who can make a choice not to live next to the highway are going to make that choice. Right? Nobody wants to live right there. Uh, well, who's got the money to do that? You know, in a in a society built around um, race and racism, then more frequently white folks are going to have the money to do that. Um, much of this is happening at the same. Uh, it's happening at the same time that there are other movements going on inside the inside the society. So 1954, Brown versus Board of Education comes around, right? And southern cities begin to really pick up uh, the pace of these renewal projects because if you can uh, if you can begin building the suburbs, then you can you can build folks far enough away to where school segregation desegregation becomes just impracticable. There's there's not a reasonable way to do it. Um, and at the same time that's happening, the civil rights movement is going on, right? And so it's being organized inside black neighborhoods. Um, a friend of mine has been on a tour through the South re- recently, and a, a week or so ago, he sent me a picture from a Baptist church in Montgomery, uh, not Dexter Avenue, but one of the sister churches there that helped to organize the movement. And there's no neighborhood around the church anymore. There's just Interstate 85 that kind of goes through the churchyard, right? So it's so all of this kind of reinforces this sense of superiority or supremacy, and not just the sense of it, but like it's actually materially built into the into our cityscapes now. Um, but people don't think about infrastructure, as you said, Josh, and, until it breaks down, right? But when it enables your decisions, then you stop having to think about some of the social consequences of those decisions. And so you get kind of this self-reinforcing um, set of systems that, you know, proclaim what's good, what's good and what's not, who's struggling and what's not and why. Uh, and and the why is especially important uh, and in the ways that it gets hidden and silenced within the culture. Hmm. Um, I, 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 w- I want to get into you know, or layer in the white churches um, element. But before you do, um, can you just describe to us, excuse me, like what your definition is of a white church? Because I think it'd be important to kind of sort of set the context. Sure. Um, So my, (laughs) uh, so I'm I'm thinking about churches where, um, where the membership and, the where the membership is white dominant, but in particular where the the leadership and the sort of cultural norms that happen inside a space are white dominant. So 
that doesn't mean that necessarily every single member on the inside is white. Um, but whiteness has been a, a theological as well as a geographical and a political and an economic project. And so, you know, where those norms of whiteness show up, um, that's who I'm thinking about. In the writing that I've done, I'm, I'm primarily writing about churches that would have been 100 percent white in the 1950s and 60s, really, at the you know during moments of extraordinary segregation. Yeah, that's, uh, that, that's amazing. So when I'm looking at like today, oh, hold, on. hold on, Josh, real, 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 real fast, if I could, um, just, I, I just, I just want, want just to have you comment on the, on the, on the layering of the white churches and like the urban, um, yeah. You know. yeah, so, um, the, the cover photo on the, on the book, is of a white man driving a bulldozer into a house during one of the urban renewal projects in Charlotte. That, that, that photograph sort of became um, like a good representation of my obsession as I'm, as I'm working on this project. Uh, and among the salient things ab about this man, his name is Ray King. Uh, he was important locally as a, as a liberal, as a Democratic Party leader. And also as a key Sunday school teacher and elder within his Presbyterian church. Um, and it at, like the further I got into this, the the more important I sort of recognized. Um, I learned from a historian named Jesse Curtis, who I had some interchange with. Who, he's at Valparaiso University. Uh, and he says in his book, The Myth of Colorblind Christians, something like that uh, when when folks picked up the paper on Monday morning, the, the Sunday sermon was still ringing in their ear. Right? And when they uh, read their Bibles, they did not put down their political commitments. Um, and so, so I started to have to imagine within that picture, like the guy who's writing this is not just a representative of this faceless government structure, right? He is a Christian and uh, he's the chair of the Redevelopment Commission. He's helped to plan these projects. And as I started going back through all the, the archives and, and all the places I was kind of digging up, like Christian identity within the folks who are uh, planning, executing, and eventually profiting from these projects, it always comes up as like a salient feature um, that, that's put out in official documents and that kind of thing. You know, here's the church membership of these men who are leading your redevelopment commission um, put out in government documents. And so... So it just struck me that like it was really important to think about the theological nature of these renewal projects. They weren't just um, land grabs devoid of any theological content, but instead what Christians were doing, what this guy's doing while he's driving this bulldozer would have made sense inside his Christian faith. Otherwise he wouldn't have done it right. Otherwise he would have protested. Uh, and so uh, to me, it was really that there's a that's a key insight. If it if if urban renewal is making sense inside Christian faith, and in some ways it still does, particularly in white dominant spaces, then that's something we've got to dig at and, and figure out how to root that out. That's fascinating to me. You know, I interviewed a one of our shows had a author named. Uh, Dr. Scott Coley, and he talked about legitimizing narratives. Yeah. And essentially, how, you know, the only way that something like, where, where something like um, the interpretation of the Bible that allowed for the kind of slavery seen in the antebellum South was able to be done was that they had to, they had these kind of legitimizing narratives that were, that were self-serving that in, and it forced this kind of um, very tortured exegesis yeah. of these passages and interpretation of these passages and, and there's motivated reasoning. And he, he went into a lot about motivated reasoning, this kind of fallacy that everybody is subject to. 
because yeah. anything we have material interest in essentially will will change our perspective of reality and will make it much easier to land on an interpretation say of the bible that fits our fits our sense of the narrative uh, of of how god is working in the world because and that's why we have to be very careful about that because our material interest understanding what those are and how they push our interpretations is so important in thinking about these churches that situated this urban renewal within like the had a theological justification for it they had to find some way maybe and and, and i guess maybe that's really my question was it like was it like they're trying to find some way that they had to kind of push to figure this out or like so much so that if they had taken a couple steps back or maybe just had a little bit of self-reflection, they would have been like, oh, wait, this is kind of a this this is a stretch. This is, yeah. you know, this is kind of not great interpretation or, sure. you know, but I'm going to do this anyway, because is it because it's because it's going to serve me. Like maybe a better way to ask the question is how nefarious was it? How much was it a product of? And again, obviously, this is in your opinion and according to your research. How much? How how much was just like, hey, this is what we've been, and this is what we've inherited. Uh, this is the worldview that we that we've received. And so we're kind of doing things to fit in with our worldview about white supremacy or yeah. this and that. Or is it like they were really like aware of the issue, but pushing these kind of theological narratives anyway? Yeah. Go um, ahead. Yeah. So I think there's. Uh, so there's some of like both sins of omission and commission, you know, is one way. Right. Yeah. That's good. Language sometimes. Um, what I, so what I've tried to highlight ultimately, I, I don't think that anybody uh, inside these projects, well, I, very few people, I think, uh, wanted to harm poor people generally or black people specifically. I think that they had been trained into a religious tradition that had prevented them from seeing those folks as their neighbors who deserved the opportunities to have flourishing neighborhoods where they had some measure of self-determination. Um, I think that, and I think I've shown to a certain extent that they had theological resources to back them up in that thinking so that they never had to ask the question of whether this course of action was really the right one. So um, the story in Charlotte that I've highlighted uh, includes the First Baptist Church of Charlotte, an all-white Southern Baptist congregation. And uh, they eventually move into the area that's abandoned, raised, taken by the first urban renewal project here in a neighborhood that was called Brooklyn. Um, when they vote to make that move, there are a couple of important things that happen. One of them is the singing of a hymn, a theological resource. And the hymn is, lead on, O King Eternal, the day of March has come. Henceforth in fields of conquest, your tents will be our home. That's the, that's the hymn that they picked for the occasion of voting to move to this newly taken space, right? It's a conquest hymn. So I think part of the argument that I'm making is not, is not about like, did they know, did they understand what they were doing? But instead, that they had been prepped by their religious tradition to make this move without having to think about it. And so when the, and so when the preacher chose the scripture for the morning where they make this vote and preaches the sermon, the scripture that he picks is from Numbers 13, uh, where the Israelites are crossing over into Canaan. They send the, the spies over. Right, And the spies come back with this cluster of grapes that they have to carry on a tent pole. And they say, um, this is a land, it's remarkable, it's flowing with milk and honey. Right, But the problem 
is that the people there are like giants, and to them we are but grasshoppers. So you have this white church that's telling themselves that there's there's this gigantic political moment that's happening that's destroying a uh, a politically weak people and their geographic environs. And they're going to move into it. And the story they tell themselves is that they are like the formerly enslaved landless people who have nowhere to go except by the power of God working for them. So that's a really mixed up theological message. Um, And I live in a gentrifying neighborhood now. Sort of, in some ways, it's kind of unexpected. Uh, We didn't think this would be happening 20 years ago, but it eventually happens. This is how our society works, right? So we got white churches moving in here. uh, And so I start going to visit them just to hear the discourse. Uh, And a, a month or a couple of months ago, I heard something that was almost verbatim that same sermon 60 years ago. So we're still floating in this, like we're still swimming in the same water. And so that's the argument that I'm pushing for. Um, Not that we could go back and assign blame, but instead to say like, we've been primed for our cities to look like this, for our souls to accept these sorts of motions and to feel helpless as though we can do nothing about it. Um, so I, I, I don't know if that answers your question well, but I, I'm sort of getting at it at, at a slightly different level than, you know, pointing yeah. fingers necessarily. No, I really, I really like that because I, I, there's a couple things. One, I really appreciate the fact that you're like, Hey, if it, if they had realized, or if there had been in a, some kind of enlightenment, or eureka moment where it's like, wait, this is not what well, my faith, this is not, this doesn't, this isn't compatible with my faith. The assumption that they would have been protesting as opposed to just ignoring that and saying, ah, whatever, my faith be damned. I'm going to, I'm going to do what I want and what's best for me. Because I think that that, although obviously people can do that kind of thing, I think people in gen, in, in general act in accordance with their convictions. They can yeah, have absolutely. slips for sure. No doubt. We all right. are imperfect. We sin, you know, we don't live up to our own standards, but at least there'd be some kind of sense of like, I don't know if this is right. There'd be pause. There'd right. be, but the kind of gusto and vigor, which they're like, yes, let's do this. It must have fit in. With their theology, yeah. right? Yeah, that's right. That's right. Which is which is very close to their to their political understanding yeah. of life. And what I hear you saying is that the argument in this book is like, hey, for white churches in particular, there's a certain kind of theology that can drive us that if we if it's unquestioned. And if there's, and we uncritically just accept it, that it can lead to the same kinds of things that probably, uh, probably the majority of people, at least the majority of white people I know. So again, mm-hmm. small sample size, but the the majority of white people I know would would not be okay with the idea. Hey, we're going in to try to displace and hurt black people people of color, the poor, whatever, right? Yeah. But we would, it, yeah, the right. theology, go ahead. And then, and right. then, Will, I know you have a question, sorry. Yeah. Go ahead, Greg. You can respond. Uh, I was going to say, so the, one of the, one of the ways that um, I think these, like these narratives, so they're really important. They, um <laughs> folks aren't going to see themselves as like willingly going in and harming somebody. That's, that's not going to be the motivation. Right. But, um, when, when our convictions, especially our uncritically accepted convictions get placed on top of that, then you sort of, you build this theological architecture on top of this set of political and economic decisions that then helps to, to reinforce it. So, 
in some interviews that I did at this at First Baptist Church of Charlotte, uh, their pastor at that time, I, I just I wanted to talk to him in overtly theological terms. How does your congregation think about you know what happened? And the short answer is they didn't really think about uh, about it for the most part. Um, but I, I wanted to ask him like, wh- what's God? How would you describe God's will in all of this? And the way that it's played out over the past 60 years in the Brooklyn neighborhood of Charlotte, this neighborhood where they are now, um, there were a dozen churches with church buildings that were torn down. There were other storefront churches. Uh, and in, in its place now are a jail, a courthouse, a government center and First Baptist Church. Um, and so I just that like, how would how do you talk about Providence in, in that term, like, how is God working in this? What What would you say to your congregation? And his response was that at least it, it's bad that there were 12 churches torn down, but at least there's a church that has been built in their place. Right? This is sort of a theological sleight of hand that I don't, I'm not sure that he knows that he's making, but the sort of the answer to this widespread destruction that again happened in like 1,200 municipalities across the country was um, this kind of like cheap understanding that if we built a church, if we built one church in place uh, of 12 black churches that had, you know, all the cultural resources that go- are going on inside black churches. Um, and now this one, this one congregation that has a hundred million dollars in real estate equity, right? That's somehow this kind of even trade off that, that grants some sort of theological justification for what's going on. Did you say a hundred so million? Me, that's a really thin. So what? Did you say a hundred million? A hundred million dollars in land equity. Yeah. Can you give me the name yeah. of that pastor? I need. I'm, I'm doing some fundraising right, right now, and uh, <laughs> holy smokes! Right. Right. Exactly. Um, and so there, so there's the one sense that they haven't thought about it. They did not think about it until I showed up and started asking questions, right? But then when they did think about it, it they they couldn't come up with a thick, interesting response that could account for all the many things that were happening. And so there's this, you know, this kind of cheap, well, obvious, you know, obviously God wanted at least one church to be here. And it just so happens that we're the ones that profited from it, you know? Uh, that, that, that's not a, that's an, a wholly insufficient answer. Yeah. So I, I guess my, my question to you is like, help me, you know, better understand the culpability of these white churches and, and sort out, you know, either explicit actions you know, statements, memorandums, like, oh, I can't wait to get those black people out of the neighborhood, you know, like, like, help me, help me separate that from just, you know, just the consequence of people of color being negatively affected whenever, like any big like project happens in the country, you know? So, I mean, you know, this, this, this even somewhat touches on like CRT, you know, like if our system is designed in such a way that, you know, disproportionately, um, and negatively affects people of color, like how, how do we separate the fact that, you know, urban renewal, you know, just isn't pushing black folks out because that's just what always happens to black folk, um, from, yeah, there was like a deliberate, you know, racist, like idea or process to, to sort of push these, these folks out. Yeah. So, um, I mean, again, the, so there's not any there's not any public documentation that I can find anyway where there are folks saying you know hey we're gonna pick this neighborhood uh, because we want to harm uh, black neighborhoods right we want to destroy them there there is though a long lineage that's more subtle but the effects are the same as if they had had those kind of negative. Um, you know, those harmful intentions, the impacts are the same, uh, where black space is simply not valued in the same way that white space is. It's assumed to be deficient in the same way that black people 
are assumed to be deficient in comparison to white people. Um, Charles Mills, I don't know if y'all know Mills, uh, his work is really important in sort of spelling out how this works geographically. The Racial Contract uh, is a is a short work of philosophy where he really gets deeply um, into this, but in an accessible way, I'd really encourage your readers to pick up Charles Mills, The Racial Contract. Um, so when, whites, when black space is devalued in comparison to black space, uh, even if it's not done overtly so, then, you know, then eventually what happens is that um, th- that black space is seen just for its exchange value. Not, so it, it has no inherent value as like the home. Uh, the homes of folks have less value than the homes of other, other people, right? So everything's expendable because it can be turned into money better by some other group of folks. So uh, that's that's the the philosophy and the and the theology that's the active kind of beliefs that are going on even when they're held under the surface um uh, and so when you so when you begin to look today for like what might we do to repair that um then i'm going to push on sort of two simultaneous things for one culturally um inside our churches inside our politics and so politically, theologically, um, that dominant story still holds. Black na- black neighborhoods continue to be undervalued in comparison to white neighborhoods because of um, the values that the culture holds generally. Yeah. Um, and you can see that. You can see that in tax assessments. Like, it's, it's not hard to find. You see this. Uh, there have been some stories about um, appraisers in the news over the past couple of years, black homes, an appraiser walks into a house and sees pictures of black people, assumes it's a black person's home. Then they come back a week later and it's white people in the pictures that the values are are very different, right? So we continue to hold that set of values. So you got to work on those values. You have to, to dig them out to say, here's what's underneath. And we have to stop. We have to change our beliefs. Um, and at the same time, you have to build, like, you have to fix some of the ma- material damages. You have to build the sorts of spaces that can flourish, without, um, that can have some measure of self-determination without being subjected to these sorts of projects or to gentrification projects or whatever yet again. Um, and so rather than saying, hey, uh, First Baptist Church, y'all were really mean in the past, you have to finance this. Uh, I think we think thinking of reparations more as a construction project. I'm informed here by a philosopher named Olafemi Taiwo, who's at Georgetown. Um, So he talks about reparations as a construction project and who needs to take on the most risk in this construction project? Well, it's the people who have profited the most from the mistakes of the past. Um, Not to say that they should be punished for what they did, perhaps unwittingly, but instead to say somebody's going to have to risk something and the rewards have been doled out unequally, so the risks for what comes next are going to have to be borne unequally. And so First Baptist Church, you're going to have to take on more of the risk than those 12 black churches that were forced out of the neighborhood. Um, you know, it, businesses, et cetera. Like you can, you can imagine the accumulated advantages are going to have to be risked in a different way to make sure that um, the communities that were harmed get more of the benefit and that we create, we sort of insulate ourselves against making it so simple to do this again. Yeah. I, uh, I, I, I like that idea of going to the system and trying to think of ways that how can we in a general way begin to give resources or reinvest resources into these underprivileged communities, uh, communities that are majority people of color and trying to help reinvest that and, 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 you know, kind of get that again, get that investment right back in. I want, I, so i'm I'm trying to think how to word this question because you know whenever 
me as a white male, I'm speaking in a way that's like, hey, you know, questioning um, that it could do saying things that could be perceived as like questioning the legitimacy of doing something like that. Like, I just want to make this statement that I absolutely am, am in favor of figuring out ways to reinvest the the general public resources in ways that really benefit everyone, but even even um, even specifically benefit underprivileged minorities and people that have had to deal with generational gaps in terms of wealth and the accumulation of material goods and and things like that, which obviously right when when you've had as in the case of the black community, you know, you go back a few, you know, how many generations, three generations, and then you, you start to potentially have people that have either been enslaved or, or their parents were enslaved or something along those lines. Maybe it's more like four. I, I haven't done the math. I'm just throwing that out there, but like, it doesn't take that many generations. Right. To go right. back. And so you can see like, yeah, I can understand how when someone had nothing, they literally were property and then they were given freedom. But then that all the things, these material benefits that were supposed to come to them were not given for a variety of reasons because of the powers that be and the, and the racism that drove those and and, you know, all the things that happened during the Reconstruction era and all of that. And again, I'm not an expert in that at all, but I, I, I just, I want to think about this, right? I, so when we go, when we're thinking about a community, let's say gentrification, right? Which I'd love to hear like more like about what that is specifically, because I, he I hear that word thrown around and I'm not totally sure I know how to give someone an adequate definition. If I were asked, Hey, what is gentrification? I'm not sure that I know how to answer that question. I'd love to hear your thoughts on that. But when I'm thinking about like a, let's say there's a a building, it's dilapidated, the plumbing is garbage, you know, it's it's got issues all over the place, it might not pass code, you know, whatever it is, and it's and it's sitting there, maybe it's an eyesore, meaning like things are falling apart, it doesn't look nice it's not going to get people that could come in and with money that could invest right because you need you know the economic realities of needing people with cash reserves to be able to come in and bring a flow of cash into that they have to feel like okay if i'm going to go here and i'm going to do this this money is going to somehow come out to be a profitable but that's just kind of like a is that like that so my understanding that that's kind of like a business principle and is it that that business principle is inherently racist i mean i don't i don't necessarily see how that i see how it could be applied in racist ways but yeah sure yeah i guess I, so my question is time? yeah i would love for you like what what is going on like what is gentrification and and how do we how do we distinguish between, hey, we just want to bring an in investment and this is what it's going to take to in, bring investment in and actually make the city or the area or whatever more valuable in today's market versus there's like, again, this more nefarious. Sure. Yeah. So I think there are, um, hopefully I can get I can get a little bit at what you're saying. So I think there are a couple of principles that could help sell um, for one. The damages of urban renewal were largely done along the lines of race. So the repairs are going to have to be lar uh, significantly done along the lines of race. Um, and in such a way that it helps to insulate those uh, the people who are being repaired against the further uh, loss of their spaces. Right. Um, so there's one basic principle. Second, uh, our our real estate system, our land system relies on uh, being able to turn land into a commodity, 
a thing, a thing that can be exchanged for money, right? Uh, and it, it particularly relies on individualized ownership uh, for that. And so we lack an infrastructure for cooperative systems that can help people to build for the common good in a in sort of a simplistic way of saying that. Um, and so this that system turns into speculation. And all, one of the kind of hallmarks of gentrification, I'm not a huge fan of the term myself, but it, it's useful uh, to a certain extent, is that you get these long terms, long uh, periods of disinvestment, followed by this speculation, where values go up, it, you know, really quickly. Um, and ultimately, that winds up doing more damage to neighborhoods than it then it really helps them. So what it takes to fix that is simply long-term incremental investment. Yeah. Um, so there's another kind of principle um, that I think can be built in. And then uh, thirdly, I think uh, back to this question of infrastructure, um, it, the suburbs aren't all white and cities aren't all black and other people of color, right? So, you know, let's not pretend that we have some binary, but um, the suburban experience has been kind of a white dominant experience and it is wildly subsidized. It takes far more money to get water, streets, police patrols, fire, uh, electricity, Etc. to the suburbs because of the inefficient use of land. But property taxes get paid at the same rate, regardless of the cost of infrastructure to get from one building to the other, right? So you can fit 100 people onto a city block and you can only fit 100 people into a, you know, 400 acres out in the suburbs. You know, that's, that's probably not very accurate, but you get, you get what I'm going for here, right? So if so if we've massively subsidized white existence in those spaces, kind of dominant white existence in those spaces, then it makes all the sense in the world to turn around and say, hey, some some people haven't gotten a fair shake. They, we need to put the same kind of investment into their neighborhoods that we've put into to other folks. So I think just like reckoning with the ways that we continue to to prop up this system um, through unequal subsidies, for instance, might offer us another principle to say this. Here's a, here's what sensible repairs might look like. Yeah. In, so in your book, you you refer um, to a, a term um, silencing spirit um, yes. and you refer to like hauntings of the past. Can you can you just kind of elaborate on what you mean by that? Yeah. Um, so I was really influenced uh, as I was writing and, and sort of studying, uh, for one, by my mentor, Ched Myers, who's a relatively well-known uh, theologian, um, but by some work he introduced me to a sociologist named Avery Gordon, who speaks about hauntings, writes about hauntings, uh, not in like the cartoonish ghost fashion, but a haunting as stories of exclusions and invisibilities. Um, so for me, like a, an important part of the research that went into this, besides all the archives and the interviews and that kind of stuff, was just walking around, like just moving around the city, especially in the places that still kind of had the scars of renewal projects. Um, and I was often really struck by the sense that there was some liveliness there that I couldn't really like the sidewalks are dead. There's nobody else on the sidewalks. These are, these are not well-functioning urban spaces. And yet you could sort of sense like there's a, there's a history that's alive here. that's hard to name. Um, so I think it's helpful to, to think of those as hauntings as ways that um, the damages of the past still have material realities in our world, even though they're hard to name. Um, I also think that's a helpful way to think about some of the gospel stories, uh, especially the exorcism kind of stories, um, as social hauntings. Uh, those exorcism stories are political stories themselves. They're not just about a, a single isolated event. They're about communities. 
So in Mark 9, right after the episode of the uh, transfiguration, Jesus and Peter and James and John come down the mountain. Um, the, the rest of the disciples are in the village, and this man has presented his son who is possessed by the silencing spirit. And the disciples can't cast it out, even though they've been under Jesus's tutelage for a while now, right? They should know how to do this. And so when Jesus kind of takes control of the situation, he asks the, the man who's presented his son, how long has this been happening to him? And when his son tries to speak, and then the, the spirit throws him into the fire, it tries to drown him, right? It, it sort of try, threatens to separate him out from his community permanently. And the man says, this has been happening to him since birth. But in effect, he says, it's not just happening to him. It's happening to us. Help us, right? He sort of shifts the, the pronouns the, the, there from singular to plural. And I, to, I take that as a as just an important clue to the way that these social hauntings work around us. The damage was not done just to this one family that I kind of highlighted within the book, uh, but we still live inside this haunted territory that continues to affect us in the ways that our cities and their neighborhoods continue to struggle. Um, and, and, you know, if we believe in the common good, if we believe in uh, our neighbors being able to flourish, then we have some responsibility for learning how to speak um, and for doing the kind of exorcism theologically, culturally, that's necessary to remove that silencing spirit so that we can learn to talk about effectively, like, well, here's what's happening around us. Here's what's happening within us. And we can't be he whole. We can't be healed until we've learned how to deal with this spirit. That's uh, I I love that. What a what a fascinating way to look in a fresh way at some of these like biblical stories, and I just uh, I really appreciate appreciate that. Like bringing that kind of depth, and then and then helping it really helps inform application right today for us. And one of my this is really the the last question, but let's say you know I'm I'm white. Obviously, I I I did a uh, 23andMe, and I'm as white as you can get. You know, like all of my uh, <laughs> all of my heritage is from like Northwest Europe. You know, basically. So I'm I'm as white. I come from pale. Talk about ghosts. You know. Like uh, white, white as ghosts, kind of, kind of lineage, and you know, obviously, you know, Will is black, but he's also Asian, Vietnamese, and uh, so he has a heritage that that stretches in in more directions than mine, in terms of geographically. In and both Will and I live in suburbs, and. We have mortgages that we have to worry about and kids that we're thinking about uh, and wor worried about, wondering about. And we will goes to my church. And so we have church stuff that we think about and we 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 wonder about and we have all these different things that are going on. And then we come into a, an interview with with Greg and we're finding out, oh man, I mean, you know, it, it's not necessarily finding out, but getting more depth and understanding into, hey, what's really happening in inner city, you know, areas and in these processes of gentrification that are kind of seem like they're a little bit of the like the descendants of this urban renewal uh, push. And I'm left wondering, well, what do I do? You know, what can I do with my limited time and resources? Will, with his limited time and resources, you know, we both, you know, we can interview you, we can talk to you, try to get this message spread, ask people to read your book. But what else can we do? How can, what can we and folks like us do to help be a, a solution Instead of someone that perpetuates the problem, you know, because I, I like I like the suburbs. I like 
I like that, you know, you get a hundred people in 400 acres or whatever it is. Right. Uh, um, I, I like that, you know, and it's, I think it's probably definitely denser <laughs> than that here at least, but the it's, point. It's, it's probably more like 20 acres, not yeah. 400. So <laughs> but your back. point is, your point is made that like, I like yep. having a little space, you know, I like not having yep. to hear people walking around um, in my ceiling, you know, that aren't, that I don't know <laughs> and that are, that I can't do anything about, you know, I can't tell them be quiet. Like I tell my kids when they're being loud upstairs, what, uh, what can we do? you know, uh, as, as just regular folks like us. Um, so I, th I think a couple of things, um, for one, we, we have to, I think it's, it's incumbent on us to recognize, um, that the spaces that we inhabit influence and inform us. Um, and, and shape us in ways beyond simply uh, personal preference. Um, so our, our architecture is part of sort of the overall package of what we believe and how we believe it and how we interact with our neighbors. Um, that doesn't mean that any one type of place is perfect or uh, perfectly bad, um, but space and, and geography and place do influence us in the ways that we interact. And they have ecological effects as well that are important to consider. Um, and uh, so alongside that, so we, we live inside of architectures. Uh, we also live inside of, of theological narratives. And uh, so part of what I'm calling on folks to do is is to look carefully at the resources that we have, the ways that uh, those theological resources have reinforced um, some of our some of the worst effects that we've had in the world, some of the worst impacts that we've had on on people and places, um, and and to carefully consider those and to repent in the place in when we need to repent um, to to kind of to take the steps that are necessary for every community to have the opportunity to flourish, uh, especially those who historically have not had those opportunities. Um, and then, uh, Josh, maybe the last thing I would say for now, anyway, because there's a lot still to unpack, um, is that as we're doing our work, especially around race, to remember that uh, white is not an ethnic designation. It is a it is a marker of power. Uh, and so having roots, uh, you and I both having roots back in Northwestern Europe is not what makes us white. What makes us white is the way that power is distributed across our society. That doesn't mean that white folks have an equal claim on power, uh, all of us, right? But, but whiteness and the system of race that was invented uh, was a way of marking power for some and lack of power for others. And so to the extent that our institutions have to operate inside that system, we also have to work to dismantle it, uh, to tear it down, um, to be renegades who fight against it and who are unwilling to uh, remain part of its logics any longer and to, uh, to create new kinds of institutions and systems that refuse to play by those rules. Um, that means reinventing some of our geographies along the way. Um, so that's what I would encourage folks to do, you know, dream big, uh, and then to take little steps to, to help make those, those big dreams into, into small, tangible practices. That's great. I really, really appreciate that. How can people pick up the book? Where can they get it? And how can they uh, follow you and your work? Sure. Uh, so Our Trespasses, White Churches, and the Taking of American Neighborhoods, published by Fortress Press. Uh, so you can get it from any bookseller. Uh, your local bookstore would be able to order it if they don't have it in stock. You can get it from Amazon or bookshop.org, which is a good alternative to Amazon for those that don't like it. Um, you can follow me through my substack, which is called Trespasses of the Holy. 
Uh, you can follow me at greggerald.com, which I do not keep updated very regularly. It's just one area of life that doesn't get done well. Um, so, but I, I'm easy to find on the internet and uh, I'm always thrilled to talk with people and to work and to, you know, guest preaching or speaking, that those sorts of things are in my bag. So I'm, I'm more than happy if you have some listeners who want to talk further. That's great. Well, thank you, Greg, for coming on the show. It's been a real pleasure. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, thanks, y'all. I really appreciate it. Absolutely. And to our viewers and listeners, this has been Greg Gerald. And again, we want you to pick up his book, Our Trespasses, White Churches and the Taking of American Neighborhoods from Fortress Press. And we will put links to that in the show notes. But until next time, guys, thank you so much for joining us and keep your conversations not right or left, but up. Take care.